Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, quite nice room here. Uh, nice to see like this big community of PX4 developers here uh, today. Um, welcome to my session. It's about ROS2 Power PX4. Uh, it's the last session before lunch, so I'll try not to kill anyone. <laughs> um, so, a quick presentation about me. So, I'm, I've been doing PX4 upstream contributions, not just PX4, but also Mavlink uh, since 2015. Um, and I've been doing code maintenance as well of Mavros since then. Um, it was created in 2014, and I've been doing code maintenance of Mavros since uh, uh, next year. Um, also, um, I'm I'm an independent consultant. I've been working with many companies uh, since 2015 as well. Um, mainly integrated into a group which is called Drone Crew. I don't know if anyone has heard of it. It was founded by, okay, was founded by James Goppert in 2015. Um, and I've been working with him as well and some other projects. Um, I created also dronesolutions.io, uh, which is something quite new. Uh, um, we are also working as consultants in other companies as well. And if no one's heard about this uh, TSC21, <laughs> then just go to GitHub. You'll see some commits and some annoying <laughs> discussions there as well. So uh, TSC21. So quick agenda. Um, the idea behind this presentation is actually um, present you what is the current state of the PX4 with ROS2 slash DDS, you can see it like this, integration, um, and also explain to you how are we, how are we doing this uh, integration and what are the technologies behind it. So I will start with a quick introduction of what is DDS, how it works, uh, how fast RTPS comes into the game as well, and how this all fits into ROS2. Uh, then explain what is our motivation behind actually uh, using uh, ROS2 DDS, and a quick comparison between Mavlink uh, versus RTPS DDS, so I can probably answer some questions that were made before as well. And then a quick uh, explanation of how these bridges are, are currently implemented and how they work. A uh, comparison between Mavros and PX4 Roscom. Probably some, you, have, you want to know as well uh, why, why do we want to bring uh, this PX4 Roscom uh, bridge uh, and as a replacement of Mavros. Uh, the future of this implementation and a quick summary. So, um, quoting the DDS Foundation, um, DDS Foundation website, um, Data Distribution Service, or DDS, it's a middle protocol and API standard for data centric connectivity from the Object Management Group. And I wanted to f um, quickly uh, focus on this, uh, uh, this expression, which is middleware protocol, API standard, and data centric. Uh, from now on on the presentation, okay? Because they, these are basically the core uh, components of DDS. It, be, it allows us um, to have a system where all uh, the, there's an integration on that system of different components in, in a, a, a infrastructure that guarantees us high confidence and reliability, data connectivity and low latency, and as well as scalable ar architecture. And it's mainly targeted, it's a standard mainly targeted to mission critical applications. So DDS is a data centric implementation. So most middleware uh, basically works by sending information between applications and systems, right? So this data centricity of uh, DDS uh, ensures that all these messages uh, basically include some contextual information that any application that is connected in the same DDS domain understands the data that it receives. So basically, it allows to any application that is connected under the same DDS domain to understand how the domain is structured and what kind of information it's actually receiving 
and who's actually publishing it, what type of uh, application is actually publishing that data, etc. So usually programmers use this data centric, uh, data -centric middleware uh, just to write code that specifies basically when and uh, when to share that data, and then basically they write the code to share the data values. So they don't actually have to worry about how the message um, infrastructure um, works. They just need to worry about the data and how and when to publish it. So this, this, this graph here, so you have data writers and data readers. You can basically associate them with publishers for the case of data writers and data readers as subscribers. So the other thing is um, uh, DDS also implements um, quality of surface service mechanisms and they're basically specifications for liability, system health and security. So these are kind of a flexible quality of service mechanism and the developer just needs to set the, key, the quality of service parameter for the desired control mechanism. So with this quality of services, for example, there, there are many examples of quality of services uh, mechanisms, but for example, if the messages don't, uh, don't always reach their intended destinations, for example, the middleware, for example, um, implements some kind of reliability uh, when that's, that's required, or for example, if the total data size of, um, that is being exchanged is huge, uh, DDS basically or intelligently filters and sends only the data to each endpoint that it's really required. So those are kind of um, mechanisms that you can find on, under uh, DDS as quality of service. Also, DDS uh, provides uh, the dynamic, this dynamic discovery mechanism, uh, which is being used by ROS too as well. So basically, one application doesn't actually have to um, configure its endpoints because there's a discovery mechanism implemented by DDS that allows to find all the publishers and subscribers under the same domain. So then it comes a Prosima Fast RTPS. And Fast RTPS by itself, it's a C++ implementation of the RTPS protocol, which is so-called the real-time published subscribe protocol. And it basically provides a way or a, a communication middleware based on publishers and subscribers that works quite well under uh, unre unreliable transport protocols as, as the, the case of UDP. UDP RTPS by itself, um, it's, uh, it, it found its roots uh, on the industrial automation. Um, it was specifically developed to support uh, the requirements of data distribution systems. Uh, and currently, and, and when it was created, uh, it was created so to find a standard or to create a standard for publish and subscribe wire protocol that closely match those of DDS. So currently, RTPS by itself, it's the wire protocol uh, underneath uh, DDS. So it allows that different DDS vendors interoperate between each other using this same wire protocol. From fast, uh, this fast RTPS from Eprosima, uh, which is the one that we are actually using in PX4, that's why I'm referring to it, um, it's complied with the current RTPS 2.2, and as I said, it's interoperable with other DDS implementation, as the case of Connects DDS OpenSplice. So the key features of fast RTPS are mainly light. It's, it's, the, case that it's the fact that it's lightweight, it's a C++ implementation, though it, it provides an RPC layer that is available through a Prosim RP, RPC. Uh, it meets high throughput uh, requirements of heavy data exchange. Um, it also meets real-time requirements of time-critical systems with latency measured in microseconds. Um, it's well fitted, as you can see, well fitted un uh, to intermittent, unreliable, and low bandwidth data links. Provides security over uh, 
networks such as Wi-Fi and radio. It's fully open source with Apache license. And this is basically the most important part. It, it is the default middleware of Frost2, and it's aligned with its development roadmap. So a quick one on Rust2. So I pick up this um, this sentence from Dirk, uh, which it's you can find it under the design documents of Rust2, which says the goal of Rust2 project is to leverage what is great about Rust1 and improve what isn't. So I'm not talking about Rust2 that much because Tolly already did that. Key features uh, uh, were already presented as well, um, so I'm also skipping this. Uh, so PX4. PX4 and RTPS, why? We wanted to take advantage, of course, so one of the first, th first things is we want to take advantage of the benefits of the DDS middleware. So, you know what, I already referred to them, so high confidence, low latency, scalable architecture. Um, we, wa we also wanted to have a more clear, uh, straightforward point-to-point -point or uh, point-to-multipoint data exchange. Uh, be between what is the PX4 internals using MicroHorb and the companion computer side using ROS2 DDS. Um, also, we wanted to make sure that we had a clear separation between what is a Mavlink stream through, uh, dedicated to telemetry, um, to telemetry links and DDS uh, used for uh, links with the companion side. At the same time, using fast RTPS, we can facilitate, of course, the integration with, with ROS2 because it's the default middleware. And based on this, um, we wanted to use uh, or guarantee at least a near optimal uh, performance standard, which is DDS, for mission critical applications, specifically for applications that require uh, external uh, computational resources, such as ob uh, obstacle avoidance visual inertial odometry, path planning, artificial intelligence. So Mavlink versus DDS. So I'm not going to like focus too much on this, but just take into consideration that Mavlink is dedicated for communication with drones. It was built for being lightweight and efficient, but uh, fortunately it doesn't uh, and in its uh, implementation, or underlying its implementation, doesn't have quality of service mechanisms. On the other hand, DDS is not a communication protocol, it's mostly a middleware with an API and it's data centric and it's designed for reliability, robustness, performance, and scalability for IoT, both for industrial and consumer applications. And basically, it's well proven in mission critical systems like uh, smart tr transportation, healthcare, and smart energy, for example. So we come up for the, uh, the, the bridge itself and how it's structured. So it's also known as micro RTPS bridge. Um, the first implementation was in 2017 from Eprosima, and that's, has been updated and received several updates since then, especially on the code generators for each part of the of the of the bridge itself. So, how does how does this bridge work? It's quite simple. So, on the PX4 side, we have the new ORB layer, so all the publishers and subscribers uh, that are connected to each module. So, they, they are publishers and they are subscribers that you want to get uh, so data from those publishers and subscribers that you want to get on this side as well. So, if a new ORB um, or if you publish for a new ORB topic and you want to get the data in this side, there's a client implementation of the micro RTPS bridge on the PX4 side that subscribes to that new ORB topic, serializes uh, into using the CDR protocol, uh, serializes that, that data and writes it to a new ORB or a UDP uh, link where an agent on the companion computer side receives that data and the process is ob uh, obviously is the opposite. So it reads, it deserializes, and then it publishes for in the fast RTPS layer for, for DDS. So if you have an application like uh, running on ROS2, you can basically subscribe to that data directly from the, the, the fast RTPS layer where it's being published. 
Of course, the, the other way around is actually possible as well. Uh, just to refer to this, all of these that I'm presenting now and what you're seeing uh, after it as well, it's all documented on the dev guide. So I'm doing a quick, uh, quick presentation of it, but there are more details uh, about this on, on, this, uh, on this link. So just a quick explanation. So how does this, all the, all, does this get built? How, how this, does this work? So initially, um, the build process needs to check if there's actually an RTPS ID allocated for that message, for a specific new or message. Because in the RTPS stream, every, every topic needs to have uh, an ID associated with after that, he actually checks what are the topics or the new ORP topics that are supposed to be published or received from the first RTPS stream. After checking that, he's actually going to generate the IDLs, which is basically uh, files uh, that represent the, the interface description language, which is required on, on the uh, fast RTPS layer. After that, and using those uh, generated IDL files, is going to generate the code based on templates for both client and agent of that micro RTPS bridge. And the last process is actually build the client immediately on the PX4 side while the agent code uh, is stored under the build folder and it needs to be built manually by. The, the user or the developer because it's um, the build process is uh, specific for the operating system or the machine that you are working on. Um, so the build process for the agent code is manually triggered, but then you can, for testing this, you can actually generate the listener application. It's optional, uh, but you can actually generate to, so to actually test if the agent and the client are actually communicating and you are getting data on the RTPS side. So then it come, then we have the ROS2 part. And the ROS2 part comes um, in a way that it represents uh, a consumer of the micro RTPS bridge. And basically, the structure or the schematic for the for the for 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 the bridge itself it's basically the same as I was explained before. The main difference here is that you have ROS2 as uh, an, a fast RTPS application on the system. In terms of the build process itself, one the the main difference is that all of the agent code is actually handled and produced and built on a, a package which is called the PX4 ROSCOM and all the message definitions that are required to actually generate the code for the ROS2 side are stored under PX4 messages repository. Again, everything explained on the dev guide and quickly just sweep around this. PX4 ROSCOM, as I said, generates and allows building the agent side for uh, the micro RTPS bridge, and then by, by consequence, in, it allows you to publish the data to ROS2. And then APX4 messages basically contains the message definitions that are required to generate the IDL files that are consumed by the agent on PX4 ROSCOM. The build process for this, quite simple. First, we need to actually have a way of deploying all of these generated scripts that are required on the PX4 ROSCOM side. And those are uh, actually deployed on PX4 uh, continuous integration system. And the, both code generated and ROS2 messages are always updated, updated on these respective packages uh, every time there's a change on, on upstream PX4 master. Then the build process is quite simple. PX4 messages generates the LDL files every time they build and also the type support and the, interf the interface code for the ROS2 side, while PX4 ROSCOM generates and builds the agent code while also uh, building some example nodes that were put in there so you can see how, how to test things and, and, and have an example for the listener or for a, a publisher code. Uh, so where does ROS1 come here? So ROS1 
as you know, doesn't run over DDS, has a different uh, middleware, uh, which was written by, by Scratch, by OSRF. Uh, so how do we integrate this with the our bridge? So we have so, something called the ROS1 dynamic, uh, or the ROS1 bridge, which can be static or dynamic. We actually use the dynamic to actually allow to connect ROS2 and ROS1, ROS1 topics, and that's, that allows you to actually use your nodes that are actually implemented under ROS1 and communicate with the PX4 site. So just a quick sweep. So to understand, why, why should we use PX4 ROSCOM? Or why should we take advantage of PX4 ROSCOM? So it uses the benefits of DDS and direct integration with ROS2, Turret, I'm saying turret, theoretically, is faster uh, with lower latency over the link than Mavros. It's still something to be tested, but theoretically, it should be faster. Uh, it has a direct and more tight connection uh, with, between the PX4 internals and the offboard components, and can be tied to other uh, DDS participants uh, that are connected under the, DD, the same DDS domain. And, MAV SDK can be an example of that. In the other way, so it actually obliges that you have a one-to-one -one conversion between the new ORP topics and ROS messages, so you, can actu you cannot actually use uh, ROS standard messages in this sense. And for connecting ROS1, as I said, you need actually an another bridge, a secondary bridge, to, to actually get data from the ROS1 side. Mavros, on the other hand, uh, is a long-tested um, and industrial-proven application. Uh, it basically parses uh, Mavlink messages and uses uh, standard, uh, uh, standard ROS messages and allows network rebroadcast as a feature. Uh, but it's not future-proof. So currently, there are no plans or no development going on currently for um, uh, updating the API to use uh, ROS2. It's directly dependent on Mavlink and, of course, of its limitations and doesn't tie directly with the PX4 internals. So no granularity and no, no granularity for introspection and control. Future, next steps. So first thing uh, I'll be working on uh, together with the avoidance team is to actually have a proof of concept of this working with uh, avoidance. So they have uh, avoidance first running on ROS1, but connected with PX4 through the micro RTPS bridge. But then the plan is actually uh, implement uh, avoidance under ROS2. Of course, uh, the, that theoretically part needs to be proven, so I'll be doing some throughput, latency, and security tests. Midterm. Um, we need a protocol splitter for the agent side that allows us that in the same serial link we can actually uh, decouple and parse both Mavlink and uh, fast RTPS messages, which is currently not possible. And in the, in specifically for the, the client side or the implementation on the, on the raw side, um, as as Toli has referred, there's uh, some good improvements and there's some work going on on the micro ROS. So we are aiming to um, implement something similar or use the benefits of micro ROS to actually have PX4 running over DDS, but with micro ROS running as well on the PX4 side not just with a parsing layer or with a, a module that does this parsing, but have ROS2 embedded on PX4. Long term. So the main idea here we, is we can or we, are, we will be able to replace Mavlink uh, with the ROS2 DDS for data exchange for onboard components. And as I said, as PX4 as a multi-node, ROS2 subsystem, so integ directly integrated with DDS. So I ask if anyone has questions.
Mm, so my question is more generally related to DDS and the, the object management group. So as someone moving from um, uh, handwritten notes and communication over Unix sockets and trying to evaluate different uh, middlewares or just to move to ROS2, um, when, you, when you go and read about DDS, it's really confusing that OMG does not by itself provide a reference implementation in C or C++, but you have all these different vendors with different right. implementations, and it's not really clear who or who in the industry is using which one or how mature a particular implementation is or whether, whether it will work on like really small systems like Raspberry Pi Zero or something. So uh, what, what are your opinions on that, and uh, how, how mature and production-ready do you think fast RTPS is? Other than that, um, your communication layer, does it only work on serial and UDP, TCP, et cetera, or does it also work on Unix sockets or, say, inter-process shared memory? It's yeah. A, yeah, so I'm going to start with the second one. It's supposed to st uh, also work with other kinds of links, not just um, network links or serial links, so yes. And f about the first question, so we aim to use fast RTPS as it's the current middleware for us to as well. We, yeah, I, that's also a good question, so why don't we explore other DDS implementations? Probably because there's no bandwidth to do it, but it's also something that we may consider evaluate based on the resources as well. So, but currently we are aimed to fast RTPS because actually Aprozima st started working with us with fast RTPS, and now we're moving on with fast RTPS since it's the middleware for ROS2. Uh, it's, so the question is if fast RTPS is mature enough to be used in industrial components and if it is certified. Yeah, it's it's supposedly certified, yes. And it's used on ROS2 based on that conception. But maybe Tolly can confirm that. <laughs> OMG doesn't really do certification. Um, they will do compatibility tests. So they have like their annual meeting, and they sit down and they check that different all the DDSs will talk to each other. Um, from our integration tests, we actually cross cross validate all the different vendors that we test with. We're testing with OpenSplice, uh, RTI Connect, and uh, Eprosima's Fast RTPS. Uh, we have found a lot of corner cases that were not covered in there compatibility test because they basically send like one message and make sure it goes over and back. Um, there is, if you need to do your research on each of the implementations, um, there are a lot of, uh, there are proprietary ones like Twin Oaks, uh, Core DX, which is focused also on microcontrollers, even before um, there was the XRCE spec. And the XRCE spec is the extremely resource constrained environment. Um, so that's what we're hoping to leverage for in the PX4 world. Yeah. Uh, all the way up there. So the question is, when would you migrate from ROS1 to ROS2? So first, first of all, we need to have a proof, of, a proof of concept, and that's why we I'll be working with the avoidance team on that. Uh, so if we have a proof of concept we, in a subsystem that is as complex as uh, avoidance, uh, and with the proper uh, throughput, uh, latency test, and all, then I can assure you that we will be able to move from Mavros to to this to this bridge. Yeah, I would say like in the next two to three months. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, during the pre presentation, you were focusing on the kind of publish subscribe uh, abstraction, but uh, there is also a very common use case for the uh, request response kind of thing, like the ROS services and Mavlink commands. So, uh, what's the story with that? If, if you want to <coughs> interface with uh, PX4 uh, from uh, ROS2 using fast RTPS. 
I'm not sure I understand the question. So the idea is, um, how can I use raw services to interface with PX4 using this same bridge? Uh, there are two basic abstractions for yes. communication, right? Publish, subscribe. Yes. That's the one that was mentioned in the Correct. presentation. Yes. And uh, request response, like okay. the ROS services, a perfect example of that. So is there any kind of support for that uh, if, if you want to send okay. like yeah. Mavlin commands to the uh, to the to PX4, because you only focused on the like on the topics. Like uh, when you map from uh, ROS to topics to uh, URP topics. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's a good question. And the idea of uh, using publisher subscriber is b because New URB is based on the same the same premise. So uh, the idea of Mavlin commands it's not actually applicable here because this is not the idea is not using Mavlin commands, but actually replace that. But we can think of something like uh, using um, requests as commands and interface directly with the modules on the PX4 side to and consider that kind of implementation. But for data parsing, data exchange, we have publish, subscribe. Anyone else? Oh, in the back. Are there any plans to bring uh, my, uh, micro TPS to other components like CAN or SPI? I think Pavel can answer that after. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to take that, Pavel? Later? Okay. Later, yeah. We're going to get that back to that in <laughs> Pavel's session after okay. lunch. Anyone else? Yeah? Yes, you can. That's the first example I presented is actually a raw implementation for fast RTPS, where you can just use fast RTPS on both agent and client, and then have a, a fast RTPS application on the computer side without actually installing raws. So yes, yeah, that's possible, and it's documented. So <laughs> DevGuide has everything for that. Yeah. All right. Uh, anyone else? Um, that's a layer of uh, Aprosima. It's implemented under their their own repository. I c I'm certainly not able to to answer that, but um, I think I I can discuss that with you after. Perfect. All right, everyone. Uh, just an, uh, one last question. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, ROS2 package. Can you package. repeat the question, please? Yes. So the, pe the question is, is uh, uh, like, explain how the ROS1 bridge works, basically, right? Or why? So ROS1 bridge is a package um, under um, ROS2, right? That basically um, makes uh, a bridge between ROS1 topics and ROS2 topics based on types, naming, etc. So you can basically publish under a certain topic name with certain type on ROS1, and the ROS2 side will get access to that data on that topic, and vice versa as well. All right. Thank you, Nuna, for your time. Um, okay. Everyone, just an applause, please.